This is Interpreting Wine founder and host Lawrence Francis inviting you to my first ever Interpreting Wine Hospitality Summit. This first of its kind audio event takes place from Monday the 28th of September until Thursday the 1st of October and will feature a diverse range of voices from London Hospitality. Attendees gain early access to episodes over the four-day event and each episode will feature a different figure from the London hospitality scene sharing stories and practical tips to help you navigate these uncertain times. Signing up will give you exclusive access to show notes for each session, giving you a list of key takeaways and strategies you can experiment with right away. And you will also get access to the Interpreting Wine Hospitality Summit private Facebook group, where you can discuss each session and access behind-the-scenes content. To sign up for this free event, just head to interpretingwine.com slash summit. Today's episode of the podcast is a rosé tasting for diploma students with Anne McHale, MW. En route to becoming an MW, Anne collected three awards for outstanding achievement, covering both the theory and tasting components. Calibrate your palate with Anne's as she assesses the 2019 Provence Rosé from Le Grand Creux at WSET Level 4. Fear not, if you can't get this exact rosé, you can still taste along with any young Provence rosé. Anne gives exam tips specific to rosé, covering bottle ageing and identifying old world versus new world rosé, before broadening out into general advice for diploma exams, and discussing her diploma therapy online coaching service, Aim to help you ace the D3 unit in October. Simply a must listen if you or anyone you know is sitting unit D3 this October. Enjoy. Hi, I'm Anne. It's great to be on the podcast today, Lawrence. Uh, I'm a master of wine. Uh, I've been working and living in London uh, since 2003, always in the wine industry. It's the only industry I've ever worked in. Uh, in 2013, uh, after many tears shed and many wines spat out, I became a master of wine. Uh, I currently work uh, independently as a consultant. So I advise restaurants and hotels on their wine lists. I um, teach regularly on the WSET diploma program at the WSET London School. Uh, I host uh, private and corporate wine tastings, and I'm involved in in wine education at every level, I would say. I specialize in teaching uh, on the French wine regions. So I teach Mm. on the D3 section of the diploma program, and the focus of my lessons is usually on France. So I teach on all the French wine regions. I'm just about to launch the second version of my signature online program, which is called Diploma Therapy, which aims to help students with the very frightening and vast D3 module of the diploma, which is worth 50% of the marks. So I've called it Diploma Therapy because it addresses not only the study and the exam technique side of preparing for this module, but also the, the mindset that you need to really succeed. Absolutely brilliant. And I think it's fantastic timing. Uh, Having looked into my audios and having looked into my episodes, seeing that the most popular episode actually ever on the podcast was the uh, edition I recorded with Jim Gore last year, which was looking ahead to uh, four diploma students and four Master of Wine students, helping them to uh, increase their marks in the blind tasting component. So, um, Following on from that, we've spoken, I know, about the possibility of doing something as a follow-up, um, and that led to today, and, and in preparation for today, um, you've chosen a wine, and you're going to essentially guide myself and guide the listeners through how you would assess that wine using the SAT uh, from the WSET. And I think before you kick off would you mention a little bit about the wine you've chosen today because I did kind of give you free reign to choose any wine that you that you wanted to talk about today 
uh, and you've gone for a Provence rosé. So what was sort of the, the reasoning, I guess, behind choosing that wine? Uh, first, we are recording this episode in summer. Uh, currently, the weather is really ropey in London, uh, but it is due to get better again. So the first reason I chose it is because I have lots of rosé in the house because it's summer and I'm a big fan. And I think we all know these days that Provence rosé is enjoying huge success. Uh, it really is the sort of spiritual home of rosé. Uh, and a good one is a really excellent summer drink. So I went for a Provence rosé, partly because I'm enjoying drinking it a lot at home at the moment, and partly because I think it's um, this particular one's a really high quality example of the type. So the context in which a rosé might appear in the D3 mm. diploma module exam would be, um, for example, in a question that that uses one grape variety. So the question might say, uh, all three of these wines uh, are made predominantly from the same grape variety. And then you might get a Grenache-based Provence mm-hmm. Rosé as one of those three wines. You could then get a Chateau Neuf du Pape, and then you might get a New World Grenache. Uh, so in a lineup like that, it could well appear. Um, the other D3 questions center around, uh, you know, either a common region or a common country, it would be less likely, I think, to appear in one of those. But, you know, never say never. The worst thing you can do is double guess what the examiners might put into the exam. So you have to be prepared that it could come up uh, in a new way. Rosé as a category features fairly regularly in the Master of Wine Tasting exams. So the specific rosé I've chosen today is the 2019 from Grand Cru. It's a Côte de Provence appellation. Uh, You may not be able to get access to this specific wine, but since it's very typical of the style of Provence rosé, you should be able to join in if you have another one to hand. So the first thing we always do in the SAT is that we look at the appearance of the wine. Uh, this has created much debate in diploma classes that I've been been in before. You know, is this rosé pink or is it orange? Uh, I'm going to say this one is uh, somewhere in the middle and it falls into the category of pink orange, which is actually on the systematic approach to tasting. So uh, the intensity is certainly pale, which is very uh, typical of the region as well. So we won't spend too much more time on that. It's pale pink orange. So let's get straight to the good stuff, which is the nose. Mm -hmm. I would say it's about a medium aromatic intensity. I'm already loving the, the, the fruitiness of this wine. There's a slight sort of candied confected note to it, uh, which has come from cool fermentation, uh, but it's an extremely pleasant candied note. Uh, The first thing that jumps out for me is stone fruit. So I would say lots of peach, apricot, nectarine on the nose there. A little bit of tropical fruit as well. I'm getting a little bit of banana. And I'm also getting red fruit, particularly strawberries. Another note that is very typical of Provence Rosé is uh, this kind of subtle dried herb character. And uh, if you go and visit the region, you'll see that there are a lot of wild herbs growing, uh, which are called in French the garrigue. So we do often in uh, in our diploma classes when we're sniffing Provence Rosé, see if we can find the garrigue notes. Uh, With this one, for me on the nose, it's more about the fruit, but I suspect we will taste some of that wild herb character on the palate. Okay, so we've got lots to pick out on the nose. So let's move on to the palate. Very first, I would say it is dry. You can't actually um, have a Provence Rosé that is more than four grams per litre of residual sugar. So the style always is to be dry. This one feels almost bone dry, uh, but that is offset by the beautiful richness on the mid palate. Acidity is never searingly high on Provence Rosé. You know, the grape varieties in this wine are Grenache, Sanso, Mourvedre, Syrah and Roll, uh, none of which is particularly known 
for its searingly high acidity. And of course, it's a hot part of France. Mm -hmm. So we're not looking at high acidity. I would be saying if I were doing a marking key for this wine, I would allow medium or medium plus. Uh, it's, it's nicely balanced and refreshing, but it's not high. Alcohol is medium. Body is squarely in medium as well. There is a creaminess to the mid palate, but it's not rich, nor is it very light and delicate, uh, like a rosé from further north in France would be. Flavor intensity for me, there's lots of it. Not quite at the pronounced level, I would say medium plus. Flavor characteristics, there's a lot that's very similar to what we had on the nose. So you're getting this lovely explosion of stone fruit, uh, loads of peachiness, apricot nectarine. Uh, there's a sort of creaminess uh, from the slight viscosity on the palate. Um, red fruits again. I am starting to pick out some hints of dried herbs and lovely citrusy refreshing finish. Uh, so a little hint of grapefruit coming in there uh, at the end. And I would say for me, the, the finish is in the medium plus category. Overall, as a quality assessment, I would give this wine uh, very good. Uh, and uh, it's certainly not designed to, to be aged in bottle. Um, this is a, it's an important point, actually, to note that bottle aging really means bottle improving. Can the wine get better? Uh, and if you don't think it's going to get better then you put it in the category of not suitable for bottle aging. Uh, but it's a really absolutely lovely example of the style. That in and of itself, I think, is going to be fantastically helpful to anybody listening who is able to get, indeed, this exact wine or, or something similar. Um, I think that uh, the points that you made are all relevant to the region, and, and, and that's the whole thing of, of having a region, isn't it, is that you've got a certain typicity that's going to be found in different examples from the region. Um, just to kind of, yeah, I guess, make this session as useful as possible for the diploma students who may well be listening. Uh, I'm just curious, you know, what might be some of the sorts of discussions that you will have in a in a session where you you've brought up this um, this wine or this style of wine and, and you've given your, your sort of assessment of that. Is, are, are there any sort of common themes that you can think of around the, the types of questions and the types of discussion that tasting a rosé tends to sort of bring up, I guess, within the students? Mm, that's a good question. I would say uh, that the most common question would be, and how can I tell that this is a Provence rosé and not a rosé from somewhere else? Uh, so, the, the best way to, 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 to prepare for that is to, to practice tasting a lineup of rosés and really look at the structural differences between them. So, for example, if you were to put this wine beside a rosé from further north in France, and the example I like to give is a Sancerre rosé, uh, but you could also put it alongside another Loire rosé or even a Burgundian rosé. Uh, you will notice much higher acidity in the wine from further north and you will notice a little less body uh sancerre rosé is said to have the sort of mineral character that mm -hmm. white sancerre has and you can definitely pick that out particularly when it's alongside a wine like this that's very luscious in it in the ripeness of its fruit so that would be one comparison to to try then you might want to get hold of a new world rosé uh in, in the past, it actually would have been easier just by sight alone to tell the difference between uh, a French rosé such as a Sancerre or a Provence and a New World style because in the past, the New World ones used to be a bit pinker, a bit richer with a little more skin contact during the winemaking. But because of the huge uh, influence that Provence rosé as a style has had on the world of rosé winemaking, it's so fashionable now to have a very pale color uh, and winemakers all over the world are adopting this uh, winemaking method. Uh, so you are, you would struggle to differentiate by sight alone, a new world style from a French style. So I would say you need to be looking at um, the weight on the palate. Sometimes there will be more 
uh, weight, more body, uh, also more intensity of fruit. And usually uh, none of those signature dried herbs or sometimes in Provence rosés, you can get a kind of saline or mineral character. Certainly you would find that in a Sancerre rosé. You don't generally find that in the New World examples. Uh, One that is quite tricky as well is Spain. Uh, Spain is very famous for its dry rosé. So how do you tell that uh, uh, a rosé is Spanish and not from Provence, for example? Again, in the past, it used to be that it had a deeper colour. More and more Spanish winemakers are adopting um, the the pale style. Uh, So I would say a little bit like the New World, you've probably got overall less elegance, less delicacy, more fruit intensity. Uh, So for me, a really fine Provence rosé should combine those characteristics. It should have elegance. uh, It should be dry. It should have some fruit intensity, some fruit weight, some creaminess on the mid palate. Um, But above all, it should be balanced. It should have enough acidity to balance all that out, but never as searingly high as the wines of northern France. And then do look out for those dried herbs as well. Which I think is great because you've really transitioned there into now talking around exam technique. Um, and one of the things that really stood out for me, the way that you assessed this wine, um, was the, I guess, relative short amount of time you spent looking at the site. Um, presumably, I guess, two things. One, in an exam situation, you want to conserve as much time as possible um so therefore is is it a is it a a question of if you get a rosé that looks like this in the exam try to recognize it as a as a lighter style but then go on and look into the nose and the and the taste which is where you're going to get more marks is that is that i mean that's my read of that if i were sitting in that exam situation what do you what do you think of that as a sort of a a bit of a a look ahead in terms of an exam technique should a rosé appear absolutely I would say with with any wine in the diploma exams you shouldn't spend too long agonizing over the appearance it's not worth very many marks you you know make a decision you write down the intensity and you write down the color you're going for Um, but then the second part of your question is of course when it's a rosé, how much uh, should you judge based on the appearance? And as I was saying, because so many winemakers are making this pale style, you really cannot draw that many conclusions anymore from the appearance. In the past, you might have said, oh, it might be Provence or it might be Sancerre, or it's so delicate. Um, but that's a risky strategy these days. So you really need to rely more on the overall structure of the wine and how it fits together. Uh, than than you rely on the appearance. So could you say something about good technique in terms of assessing those three wines, but potentially smelling, tasting them sequentially, coming back to that? Do you have a, a preference for, for what you would do if you were in that sort of situation? And I think sharing that may well help people to to kind of, I guess, yeah, adapt and and train in their own exam style. The D3 diploma testing exams are always arranged in flights of three. So you should approach each group of three wines separately. And the very first thing you should do is read the question. It really always sounds obvious, but when you're under pressure, it can really go out the window. I've run various mock exams in the past and people haven't seen the thing that says these wines are all predominantly made from the same grape variety. And so then they go completely off piste. So you must read the question and see if the question is giving you any clues. Um, And then you have to sort of think logically, okay, if these wines are all made from the same grape variety and one of them is pink, that actually gives me quite a lot of clues. It narrows down you know, what the options could be. Uh, So you're really just using your theoretical knowledge of the world of wine there to think tactically. When it then comes to tasting the wines, uh, my approach always was before I put any of the wines in my mouth or started writing any notes, I would nose them and write down my very, very quick impressions on the nose because your palate is very fresh right at the start of the exam And you can gain a lot just from those initial impressions. Um, Then when I started tasting the wines, 
I would use them, you know, kind of to benchmark against each other. Um, but you just must remember that in each answer, when you're answering each wine uh, appearance, nose palette, you must never compare one wine to another. Uh, there's a little section at the end sometimes where you're asked to speak about all three wines together. But in the assessment of each individual wine, you mustn't you know, say, oh, this is more intense than wine one, for example. But in your personal tasting, you are making those judgments because it will help you to, to do that benchmarking. One last question, really, around technique and, and approach. And it was, again, something that came up in a previous episode, which is around quality assessment. Uh, and I'm just curious, could you say something around that? You know, how for this wine... Uh, you know, what are the things that you you have in mind when you're making a quality assessment? And what are sort of some of the, the key things to bear in mind again when you're under that time pressure? Well, I'm very big on um, practicing your quality answers almost dry with, without necessarily always having uh, a wine in front of you. Uh, and that is something we really do focus on in the diploma therapy sessions. And we look at... Um, my sort of special formula that I have for crafting uh, a full mark quality answer. And the one thing I always say to students is consistency is absolutely crucial. Uh, on the day of the D3 exam, there will be a panel of examiners. Those examiners recognize that, you know, this is a subjective process. The systematic approach to testing is an excellent system for making it as objective as possible but there is still subjectivity. We all have different palettes. And even the examiners, when they are creating the marking key on the day of the exam, um, won't always agree with each other. Sometimes they will be absolutely un unanimous. They will say this wine is high in tannin and it's high in acidity and it's outstanding quality. Uh, but that won't always happen. So where the examiners feel there's a little bit of leeway, they will allow two options for quality. However, they will not automatically award you marks for having chosen one of those two options if you are not consistent with the observations that you made in the appearance, nose and palate sections. So it's very important that when you come to write your quality assessment, you look back at what you observed about the wine. Uh, and if, for example, you have said medium, 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 medium the whole way through, and then you try and say the wine is outstanding, um, you know, that that will not go well. So consistency is absolutely crucial uh, and uh, practicing writing these answers. Yeah, absolutely. And I think my observation of really all of the, the tips that you've given are, are that they, they, you know, in the cold light of day, they probably sounding to everybody listening and, and sounding to me like good common sense, you know, the, you know, before you make an assessment of quality, go back and see what you've said about it in the previous answers. But I, I fully recognizing as well, though, that, that under exam conditions, all, all sorts of things can happen. Um, and that that kind of repetition and, and just, you know, muscle memory, trying to really lock those behaviors in there, um, make your mistakes at the kitchen table uh, with or without the wine um, and make them before you get into the exam and, and kind of you know chisel them out and, and really get that locked into the into the, the the brain so that when under the pressure you everything's not going to sort of fall apart you're going you're going to keep those things that you've been practicing and they they become automatic I think under even under the exam pressure absolutely really is the last question now uh I, I think it's yeah just to say yeah huge thank you to you Anne. Uh, it's been yeah real uh, another amazing learning experience um and yeah i think this will certainly help lots and lots of people and and i really just want to give you the opportunity to share with those listeners who are on the diploma uh, and who are i guess still to do the d3 tell them a little bit more about diploma therapy uh, that you've already mentioned, give them a bit more detail and, and potentially next steps if it's something that they'd like to consider. Certainly, yes. Uh, well, I, I first saw the need for diploma therapy um, when, you know, I started teaching D3 students 
uh, three or four years ago. Um, and they, they all just felt so daunted by the sheer vastness of this module. Uh, it's worth 50% of the marks uh, in the new format. It now happens over two days. So it just seems quite challenging that 50% of your entire diploma grade is awarded based on those two exams, the testing and the theory. Um, and, and a common uh, query I had from students is, and where on earth do I start? It's absolutely vast. And anyone listening who has already enrolled on the diploma program and who knows um, the size of uh, those online notes uh, will understand what I mean. It's absolutely enormous. So in diploma therapy, that's one of the first things that we address is where do you start? What do you do? How do you break it down into manageable chunks so that you can actually work your way in an efficient way through the material without becoming overwhelmed by the sheer level of detail. Uh, we also talk about how much of the detail do you need to know for the exam, um, which is another common query. We, uh, we talk a lot about um, different study techniques and then coming up nearer to the exam time, we focus a lot on exam technique, how to maximize your marks when you're actually sitting there under pressure, how not to forget uh, common points to include. Uh, and then the the therapy side of it really is also based on my personal experience, because I, of course, went through this exam myself and then went on to do the Master of Wine. And, you know, it's it, ha- it takes a psychological toll uh, as well. And you need to really be as psychologically fit uh, as you as you are, you know, knowledgeable is how I would put it. So we focus on that element of it as well. Um, I plan to launch the next version of Diploma Therapy in uh, July. So it's a mixture of uh, recorded modules from me uh, and then live coaching options as well. So more will be revealed. Uh, If you would like to get on the waiting list to hear more when the program is launched, you will find that at annemichael.com forward slash diploma coaching. And I'm sure, Lawrence, you will put that in the notes so that people can link to that. Thank you so much, Anne. An absolute pleasure, as always. I really think that this episode will help a lot of students out there. And you're obviously a natural for the format, so I hope this isn't the last time you'll be appearing. As mentioned in the episode, you can join the waiting list for Diploma Therapy by heading to annemichael.com slash diploma coaching. And if you do join the list, then do please mention Interpreting Wine when signing up. To subscribe to the podcast or to discuss sponsoring an episode or series of your own, just head to interpretingwine.com. And if you're a diploma student, I would love to get your feedback on this episode and also to hear what other support might be useful in the lead up to October. You can connect with me on social media where I'm at Interpreting Wine on Instagram and Facebook, at Wine Podcast on Twitter, and email hello at interpretingwine.com. See you next time.